Just a quick note before we start this episode, we'd love to hear what you think about Mind Over Chatter. What does your mind have to say about our chatter? Get it? Anyway, please fill out our survey. You can find the link in our episode descriptions. Knowing what you think will really help us out. Now, on to the main event. Hello, and welcome back to Mind Over Chatter, the Cambridge University podcast. I'm Nick. I'm James. And I'm Naomi. And together, we're inviting you to join us in our conversations with clever, curious people here in Cambridge. Just like you, we have questions about the world. Deceptively simple questions. So one series at a time, just as fast as our little brains will allow, we'll get together to talk about these simple questions. In this second series, we're talking about futures. So in this first episode of the series, we're going to be talking about time, what it is, and therefore what the future is. Now, things are about to get weird. We're going to be talking about everything from physics to linguistics. From broken eggs to Einstein's theory of relativity. Well, I can't wait to get started. So who are we talking to in this episode? We talk to a philosopher of science. Hi, I'm Matt Farr. I'm a philosopher of science at the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. And I work on all kinds of interesting and difficult philosophical problems, mainly concerning things like the nature of time. A professor of psychology. Hello, I'm Nikki Clayton. I'm professor of comparative cognition in the Department of Psychology at the University of Cambridge. And I'm also scientist in residence at Rombert, the dance company in London. And a professor of linguistics and philosophy. Uh, hi, I'm Kasia Yashtot. I'm a linguist and a philosopher. I'm professor of linguistics and philosophy of language at a theoretical and applied linguistics section of modern and medieval languages and linguistics faculty. I'm interested in meaning, uh, in the concept of the self and the concept of time. As usual, we began by asking our guests to tell us a bit about their research. I'm interested in the big question, what is meaning? meaning in human mind, in the world around us, and in language. Uh, one of my projects concerns the human concept of time that can be gleaned from uh, how we express passing uh, time and location in time in different languages, languages from different uh, language families, and how such human time can be reconciled with what we can call real time of physics, that is time that doesn't flow. I'm interested in how animals think about time and whether they're capable of planning for the future. You might think that the most obvious animals to investigate would be our closest cousins, the chimpanzees or even other primates for that matter. But as a dancer and someone obsessed with movement, I'm more interested in more alien minds, more distantly related animals. And for that reason, I have a passion for studying the crows. And by crows, I mean members of the corvid family that includes jays and ravens and jackdaws and magpies. Yeah, so I work on uh, kind of big philosophical problems in the foundations of physics and across the sciences more generally. So I started off you know, growing up reading like new scientists and watching physics documentaries and stuff. And what got me interested was these kind of big questions like, you know, does time have a direction? Uh, is there a difference between cause and effect? And the idea that through developments in physics that we have to update our concepts about things like time. So what interests me is how we go about addressing these sorts of questions. What does physics say about time? How should that influence how we think about our concepts about things like time and causation? So really, in my work, what I do is really connect work in physics with work in psychology and more generally the kind of the role of conceptual analysis in philosophy concerning these things. OK, so in this series, we're thinking about the future. The whole entire series has, has got something related to the future. But obviously, to understand the future, we, we need to first talk about time. So I'm going to throw this question to you, Matt. You're a philosopher of science. And, you know, we as humans understand time as going from past to present to future. Now, is that how time actually works? Well, it's an interesting question, right? I mean, we can think about how are we meant to learn these things about time, right? What are the limits of, say, the physics of time in answering these questions? 
And what we see is really there's there's a range of different theories of time that we can use to try to interpret the physics or we can we can relate to what the physics says. So questions that we normally consider are things like, you know, does time really flow? Are the past and future as real as the present? Is there some sort of fundamental direction of time? You know, does reality really go from the past to the future? So one thing that's received lots of attention over the centuries is what really makes time different from space. And a common kind of popular idea is that time is somehow dynamic, right? So it flows like a river, it passes by like some kind of moving object. Now, these are obviously metaphors, but, you know, they, they appear to point to some sort of special property of time that space apparently lacks, right? Space, on the other hand, is usually thought of as something fixed and static and immovable and so on. So the question here is, what does it really mean for time to flow? And this is something which, say, physics rules out. So a popular theory of time, so fortunately, the, the different theories of time have very simple names. So we'll start with the, the A theory of time. Right, this is a theory of time that holds that time literally does flow or pass. So we can think of this in terms of there being some universal now, a kind of global present moment that's always moving along, that makes things in the future become present and sends things which were present into the past. And, and why is that called the A theory of time? Uh, it goes back to a paper by uh, a, a Cambridge philosopher, a metaphysician called John McTaggart Ellis McTaggart. Uh, he was based at Trinity College at the beginning of the 20th century. He wrote a, a really influential paper published in the philosophy journal Mind, and it was called The Unreality of Time. He actually argues that time isn't real. But to do this, he he tries to put forward a few different understandings of what time could be. And he said, well, for, we can try to write down, say, what goes on in the world in terms of different time series. And the first series he just called the the A series because it's like the first one he wrote down, I guess. And this is like the ordering of of events in time in or in uh, in terms of whether they're past, present, or future. I so, see. So it's not A A for arrow or anything like no, this. No, no. So we have like the A theory and the B theory, and I defend a thing called the C theory, which I I can come on to in a little bit. Sometimes the B theory is also conflated with the idea of the the so-called block universe so you, you might think b stands for block but in reality i don't think there was much behind the 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 use of these these terms they don't really stand for anything no it's sort of a boring classification well so you said there was the a theory and then the c theory this is what you're you're a defender of is that right yeah so the the usual the debate in philosophy of time is between a theorists and b theorists so so like i say a theorists think that time really does pass so some a theorists take this as like an extreme view and think only what's present is real so reality as a whole is sort of you know changing over time things come into existence and then sort of pop out of existence in the past b theorists uh what they have in common is that they just don't think that time really passes like this so we may have this you know, this belief that time passes, or it may feel like time passes, but either this is a, a kind of systematic illusion, or it's just some sort of harmless but misleading metaphor that we use to talk about time. But B theorists have this view that, well, you know, things in the past and things in the future are as real as the present. We're just not, lo we're not located there, right? We're always talking where we are currently located. So we kind of attach some special significance to those things which are kind of simultaneous with us. But for a B theorist, I can think, well, you know, I might talk as though my time right now and our time right now is special, but I don't think I'm more correct in saying I'm present than people were in the past and people are in the future. We can think that there are people sort of out there in the past and future, maybe, you know, our, our younger and older selves, and they're not wrong when they think they're uh, present. We're just present relative to different times. How do B theorists deal with entropy? Because it seems to me that I, I'm allergic to eggs, so I hate the dumb things anyway, but it seems to me that when you smash an egg, there's no way of unbreaking an egg. Do, do they just say time's irrelevant there, or is that a sequence rather than a time? 
And can you just tease out for us the connection between entropy and the egg here? Remember, we're not speaking to specialists here, so... But the unbreaking of an egg is the idea that the way in which energy organises itself is that it goes in one direction, not two directions. You can think of realities where when you throw a stone into the into the lake, you don't have these concentric circles going out, but they, they can actually go in. So we simply inhabit a, 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 a world which is appropriate for us. Is that right, Matt? That uh, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not necessary that entropy always increases everywhere. So I think this is a nice kind of way of dovetailing to, uh, to talking about the difference between the, the B theory of time and the position that I, that I, I hold, which, is, which I call the C theory of time. So if you think that the the debate between the A theory and the B theory is whether time is really dynamic or whether it really flows, there's there's a different question which isn't really settled with, within this debate, which is whether time has some, some basic direction. So B theorists still might think that time nonetheless is ordered in terms of earlier and later, right? So we can think things are stretched out across time in some sort of, you know, non-dynamic way. But there really are certain things which are just earlier than other things. And in this sense, time can be thought to have some preferred direction. And the C theory is a position which, which denies that. It holds that there isn't really anything objective or absolute or fundamental about the difference between earlier and later. But we just prefer for various reasons to think of the world as going from earlier to later rather than later to earlier. Now, the issue of entropy, as you've raised, is is relevant here. Uh, entropy is, so it's a term which comes from uh, thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics, which is a law which says that the, the entropy of isolated systems does not decrease over time. Now, there's lots of different definitions of what entropy is. And I'll try, I guess I can try to talk about it in the kind of the simplest possible terms that hopefully won't offend physicists. We like those. We like those. No, those are great. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, commonly people talk about entropy as like a measure of of disorder in the universe. So we think that you know, things are becoming disordered over time. Really what entropy usually uh, historically refers to is like a measure of the the unusable energy of some systems so imagine some sort of steam engine it it gives off kind of heat that can't be harnessed for work over time so there's this kind of measure of disorder that that increases over time we can think about this in any sort of ordinary situation we can find ourselves say i'm holding a glass of water and i drop it on the floor right it it shatters it spreads out uh and that's something that you know, hopefully doesn't happen a lot but it certainly happens more often than the temporary reverse process, right? We, there's no, no nothing we can do. We can't just click our fingers and make these little shards of glass start to sort of jiggle until they spontaneously jump together, form a perfectly smooth wine glass and, and you know, come to rest in my hand, right? So these sorts of processes we can refer to as being irreversible processes, right? What's really noticeable about them is that we think that they really do happen in a particular direction in time. If I were to show you a video of uh, this process of the smashing of the glass and played it backwards, you'd quickly come to see that it's a video played backwards, right? Well, it's really recording the temporal opposite of what you're seeing. So we have like really clear uh, intuitions about the direction in which things are happening. This is very closely related to this, this second law of thermodynamics, this idea that there's a particular trend of things to become more disordered over time not to spontaneously uh, form into a particular order okay things got heavy pretty quickly i need a bit of a time out don't worry we're ready for this yeah we've got tracker bars kendall mint cake and raw slabs of jelly to keep us going well that explains a lot okay so we've basically only been talking about the first question so far right and that was does time actually flow from past to present to future that's right this series, we're interested in talking about the future, but we figured we should get a better handle on what the future actually is. And it turns out the answer to this is a lot more complicated than we initially thought. Yeah, Matt introduced us to three pretty profound but not very creatively named theories of time. 
the A theory, the B theory, and surprise, surprise, the C theory. Let's meet the A theory first. Hi, I'm the A theory of time. According to me, time flows and passes, and events can be ordered in terms of when they happened. Like this, past, present, and future. Super simple, super intuitive. We can thank John McTaggart, Ellis McTaggart, a philosopher at Cambridge in the early 1900s for this theory. He spent a lot of time arguing that time is not real. How ironic. Uh, did I hear that right? John McTaggart, Ellis McTaggart? Yes, you did. He was originally named John McTaggart Ellis, but his great uncle died and left money to family members with the surname McTaggart. So John cunningly tacked an extra McTaggart onto the end of his name and collected his inheritance. Wow, philosophers are sneaky. Anyway, the A theory of time is pretty much how most of us might intuitively think about time. Let's meet the B theory now. Hello, I'm the B theory of time, also known as the block theory. According to me, time doesn't flow or pass. Sure, time can still have a direction, past, present and future, but it doesn't progress. Nah. Instead, the past, present and future all exist at once, at different points in a four-dimensional universe. Yeah, you heard me, four dimensions. So, sure, you can have an order to events in the universe, but they all have equal footing in my block universe. And you better respect that. I'm not sure I'm following. It's like I'm watching Tenet or Interstellar all over again. Have another tracker bar. I'm on my fifth. Here's Matt's analogy from something he wrote recently. Think of a traditional wall calendar, which shows all of the days of the month laid out with equal emphasis. That would be B theory. Compare that with a smartphone calendar that is constantly being updated, highlighting the present day as special. That would be more A theory. Okay, I'm both nodding and smiling, nodding and smiling. If it makes you feel any better, philosophers, physicists, and mathematicians, even good old Albert Einstein, like the idea of B theory because it fits better with their equations. And admittedly, physics has done pretty well without needing to explicitly think of time as something which passes. Which is good because it means physics still works during the pandemic during which time has basically stood still. Let's now meet the C theory of time, Matt's own theory. Hello, I'm the C theory of time. According to me, not only does time not pass, but it doesn't even have a direction. What does this mean? Well, we think of events in the past as fixed and the future as undecided and open to possibilities, yes? But if time has a direction, that implies it could have had the opposite direction. Mind blown. Here's where we started talking about broken eggs, stones thrown into water, and spilling things all over the place. There is nothing more upsetting than watching a hard-boiled egg crack in the pan, just knowing that its yolky goodness is now consigned to a hard-boiled, watery grave. Curse you, Entropy! Yep, Entropy is Humpty Dumpty's kryptonite. But remarkably, physics does hold open the possibility that you might be able to put an egg back together although it would have to be a very small egg. Like a Cadbury's mini egg? No, more like an itsy bitsy quantum egg. See, apparently the equations that describe quantum physics work just as well forwards as backwards in time. So things sort of like breaking an egg do seem to be reversible if looked at from a quantum perspective. But surely there's more than just physics when it comes to thinking about time. Isn't there a psychological component too? Absolutely. These theories definitely all have something to do with how we perceive and talk about time. Hence why we've got a linguist and psychologist in the conversation too. This reminds me of that great bumper sticker, like, don't always believe what you think. And I, I was just going to pose a question to Nikki, mm. right? So we've talked a lot about a lot of theories here. Can you sort of maybe explain to us a little bit about how um, the mind... And yeah, understands the concept of time. I, I wanted to um, give you a famous phrase and then explore the psychology of it. And I wanted to say very briefly, and don't worry, I won't take more than a minute to do all this, <laughs> why magic is so important in this endeavour. Okay, so the phrase I want to give to share with you all, and many of you may know it already, is you don't remember what happened what you remember becomes what happened. 
And I think what's interesting there is that we all know that time and memory in the human mind are subjective. Einstein talked about it eloquently in his day. Since then, psychology has been founded as a science and a number of psychologists have looked at it in great detail. But we know that there's something about memory. And in fact, the man that founded our department then called the Department of Experimental Psychology, now the Department of Psychology, um, was the master of this, Sir Bartlett, who argued about the reconstructive nature of memory, that each time we revisit a memory, we change it slightly. And, you know, we change our perspective on how we interpret what happened and we change the timings of events. And I think the one thing we know about the psychology of time is actually we're very bad at reverse engineering any kind of sequences. So if I wear my dancer's hat and I say, well, um, look at choreographers and how somebody like Wade McGregor, for example, explores this in a dancer's body, if you ask them to reverse a sequence, they struggle in a way they don't with a forward sequence. If I do it more simply, we could just practice saying the alphabet backwards and you can't do it nearly as quickly as you can forward. We're very bad at reversing time. So the main point that I'd like to make, I suppose, is that memory evolved with the future in mind, not the past. So we're much better at going forwards, not backwards. And magicians capitalise on this all the time. So many magic effects work. Everybody says magic effect works because they're tricks on perception. Mm, Not really. Some of it's perceptual, of course. We're visual animals, but a lot of it is to do with memory and the fact that we're very, very inaccurate at reverse engineering a sequence. So it's one thing to say that mental time travel, the ability to remember the past and think about the future, goes backwards and forwards but we're much better at going forwards and backwards. I just I think it's also interesting that we are not very good at uh, objectively judging the uh, the ratio at which time passes because as you probably know when you go on holiday and a lot happens in a day we think a lot of time passed when it was actually one day when very few interesting events happen time just drags so that's what uh, people call the density of events by the unit of time. And also there are other factors such as um, when uh, when you are uh, emotions, when you wait for uh, a dentist appointment, time drags. Uh, when you wait for an exam, time drags. When, when you are happy, time passes quickly. Um, sometimes time, disappear, time disappears when you're engrossed in your work. It's just it's called the, the flow when you're engrossed in your work and you are all your work. You, you forget that you are you are a person. It's just you are one with your project. Then there is no there is just no time. Uh, so one one thing is direction and another that it's just so very very subjective. I think another is counting. So I think one of the interesting things about animal studies and some of the cultural differences whether you judge time as distance. Um, And I I think that's probably also true of cultures that don't have numbers for quantities. So there are these Amazonian tribes that have one, two, three, few and many, and they judge time differently from the way we judge time in the Western world. So I think those cultural differences are interesting because they say something about how language shapes the way in which we view time. Um, Nikki, this is... This is I've not presented the evidence for space, but it's... <laughs> this well. is fantastic that you say that because I was actually just going to lob a question in Keisha's direction and I was going to ask about language. I was wondering if you could give us some examples of how different languages talk about or, or think about time differently, express these ideas of time differently, and, and, and why these differences matter? 
Uh, okay, first I, I want to perhaps reply to Nikki, yes, that's very interesting point about cultural differences. In fact, there are even languages uh, of the Amazon like Piraha uh, where there aren't any number terms. So uh, um, when a mother wants to say I have one child, she says I have a small quantity. When she wants to say I have eight children, she says I have a large quantity. And it, But the thing is that the extent to which language shapes the concept is, is is debatable because then when these members of these tribes start trading with members of different cultures, different languages, they can acquire numbers very quickly because they have to acquire the prices, the, they have to negotiate the prices. So, and there's no problem whatsoever for them to, to, to say that something will be $5. Um, so language, yes, language enables us uh, to, it facilitates um, the, the so-called thinking for speaking, where we, where we want to externalize our thoughts, but we are all capable of pretty much the same things. That's fantastic. Can I just say one more thing in response to that, Kasia? Because I think you and I are on exactly the same homepage on this. So what they did in the studies with, with the people was it's not that they couldn't distinguish the quantities. So if you did something surprising, so back to magic, you know, two things have go behind a screen and then all of a sudden five things appear rather than two or zero or nine or whatever, the people noticed. So it's not that they don't perceive it, but it's that the language kind of, structures the way in which you choose to communicate those things and then if you're given some other context where that communication isn't going to be helpful so that's why I always like to think about it as as thinking without words and thinking with words rather than it being thinking without language because the language plays such a huge role but we all have our biases in how we choose to express things yeah, absolutely right. This is what I called the, the term for it is in, in, in anthropological linguistics is thinking for speaking. When you prepare your thoughts for, for saying them, uh, then you use words. And here I want to, I want to talk about this, uh, how, how language determines or colors your thoughts. There is this old hypothesis uh, called Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, according to which uh, language precisely does that. It determines the way how we how we think, uh, it determines the way how we perceive uh, the, unit of the world. Uh, nobody really believes this strong version of the hypothesis anymore. Some people believe that language colors our perception of reality. But uh, what is interesting is that there is a new version of, of, this, uh, of this view now. You do, uh, don't need the labels, but it's just the new view, new orphanism, uh, according to which there are two levels. We have a level of words and structures in language, but underneath there is this level of basic concepts. And we see that there are cultural differences, uh, there's cross-cultural the cultural diversity on the level of, of word structures. Uh, so what uh, in one language uh, you will call um, a candle, in another you would call wax uh, or long object because they categorize things differently. But uh, what we want to find out is whether the, the pool of those basic atomic meanings, the basic conceptual building blocks is universal for all cultures. And uh, if it is, if we can put these atoms together into molecules, that is words, then it shows that we actually all capable of thinking the same. And if we don't, it's only because language kicks in and it facilitates one route or the other. If uh, in my language I have number terms, then I will see things readily as numbers. Uh, if my language has certain distinctions between, uh, I don't know, kinds of snow, although that I think is a bad example because if you are a skier, then you know about types of snow anyway, no matter what culture you belong to. Mm -hmm. Then uh, in, in this language, it, language will facilitate uh, uh, that, uh, that kind of um, lexicalized, a concept which is dressed into a word. So I'm personally, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm convinced that there is this uh, level of universal concept, and this is what I'm using actually to talk about time and how deep down there are no differences between cultures in how we conceptualize time. 
uh, for example, there is a language in which there is something called double tense. Uh, when you want to say that, for example, uh, the ancestors built a house, you have to use a tense, a grammatical tense that conveys all this, that the building process of the house was a long time ago, that your discovery of the house uh, was uh, recent, also that you didn't witness the work on the house, but that you saw the house with your own eyes. And this tense has a, a really fancy label. I know you don't like labels, but it's distant past inferential because you infer the process and the recent past experiential because you saw it. All right, remind me how we got started here. We started this section by trying to understand how the mind understands the concept of time. Nikki gave us a great quote. You don't remember what happened. What you remember becomes what happened. And in my case, what you don't remember never happened. Thank goodness this makes me feel a whole lot better about some particular evenings back when I was a student. Also, we're bad at reverse engineering any kind of sequences. Example, James, how good are you at staying the alphabet backwards? Do you hear that noise? That is the noise of the Game of Thrones shame bell ringing at my inability to say the alphabet backwards. Point made, magicians often capitalize our propensity to reverse engineer a sequence of events incorrectly. We often end up assuming cause and effect, which is just plain wrong. And what about Kasha's point about how our perceptions of time change? Oh yeah, apparently it's really true that time flies when you're having fun. Or, more generally, that the passing of time is subjective and really does change depending on what you're doing and feeling. I'm hoping that when asked, our listeners will estimate the average length of an episode to be about 3.7 seconds. That's how much fun they're having! We also heard how culture and language can have a big impact on our perceptions of time. For example, some cultures don't have words for specific numbers. We heard about an Amazonian tribe which just uses the words for small quantity and large quantity. I think that's the language my brain speaks when it comes to mental arithmetic. But these cultures can easily acquire the concept of numbers when they have to. For example, when they start trading with others who do use numbers in the way we're used to. Kasia also mentioned the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Sapir-Whorf being the first linguistic theory to join Starfleet. Today is a good day to discuss linguistic relativity. Bonus points if you get that reference. The Sapir-Whorf hypothesis comes in both a strong and a weak version. The strong version says that language completely determines how we view and think about the world. So in this case, the passage of time. The weak version says that language may shape how we think about and perceive things, but doesn't completely determine our perceptions. For example, if your language has lots of words for different shades of blue, you may be able to better distinguish between different blues than someone whose language doesn't make that distinction. But it doesn't mean you can't see the differences between shades at all. And if your language has lots of different words for blue and black, white and gold, then you should avoid discussing ambiguous lace dresses at all costs. So it sounded like neither Kasha nor Nikki were on the side of the strong version of this hypothesis, is that right? I think that's fair. Kasia also told us about a new version of this theory, which says there's two levels to language. One, words, and two, basic concepts. There are clearly cultural differences on the word level, but researchers are wondering whether there are differences on the concept level. Kasia thinks that basic concepts are shared across cultures and that this means there aren't actually any differences between how time is conceptualized across cultures. In the next segment, we're going to bring back Matt into the conversation. So in preparation, let's remind ourselves of those three theories of time. Hi, I'm the A theory. Time has direction and flow. Hello, I'm the B theory. Time has direction, but doesn't flow. No way, no how. Hi there, I'm the C theory, Matt's favorite theory. Time has neither direction nor flow. Can I uh, bring Matt back in here? And I'm kind of curious how this conversation that we've been having, how this fits into your very different conceptions of, of the true possible nature of time, I guess. Not that it necessarily flows in one direction, but this this C theory of time, which you you know you may, may have to recap for me, but you know how how does language and the way in which we think about time come into these philosophical theories about time? So, where a lot of these kind of philosophical problems are born is 
in the fact that, say, that the physics of time seems to give a very different picture to the one that we're accustomed to in how we normally talk about time. So the kind of the ways we refer to, say, our psychological models of time. So there's certainly a big lack of fit between the picture of time as really flowing from past to future and the sort of, you know, four-dimensional static view of the universe that we seem to get from, say, relativity theory. So, you know, some have seen that maybe the, the main role of philosophers in this is try to match together the, the so-called scientific and manifest images of time. And this is certainly something which has uh, produced a lot of, I guess, philosophical models in the past. So one person who thought a lot about this was the, the astronomer Arthur Eddington. Uh, Arthur Eddington, among other things, was uh, the person that supposedly uh, observed and demonstrated and confirmed the prediction of general relativity theory that light waves bend around massive objects. So Eddington, in one of his more philosophical books, got stuck on this problem that the time of physics seems to be you know, really not fitting his own kind of perceptions of what time is. And he found that really problematic. He's, he was like, Eddington, the physicist, really disagrees with Eddington, the person, about this. There's just this big lack of fit between what physics appears to say and what we think and you know, conceptualize about time ordinarily. So, you know, when I'm talking about the position I defend, that the sea theory of time, that holds that you know, really there is no direction of time. Now, that clearly sounds to be flying in the face of how we ordinarily talk about time and one important thing when you, you know, defend this sort of view is to make clear that it's not pointless and misleading and unhelpful to talk in the ordinary ways that we do about time the main thing is that we have to be careful when we use these kind of models of time to note that their sort of restricted applicability when we're looking at things like fundamental physics. Now, if you look, say, at uh, relativity theory, special the special theory of relativity kind of lacks the space-time structure to talk about two distant events happening at the same time. It's just something which doesn't really make sense in the language of the theory. So people have taken that to mean that really there is like no global present moment and various philosophers have argued therefore that this means that really there there is no such thing as the present it's just some sort of illusion and all things just sort of exist together on a par and and so on now what motivates me in holding that time doesn't have a direction is is things like uh things like the following so when I talk about the smashing glasses earlier and we have this intuition that these sorts of processes really do have a preferred direction in time, these are things that don't really carry over to when we're thinking about fundamental physics. And one of the, the relevant issues there is that the basic laws of physics are symmetrical in time. They're, they're invariant under reversal of time. What this means is that if some particular process, like some movement of particles, uh, is allowed by the laws of physics, then so is the temporally reverse process. So if you take any you know, imaginary video of some fundamental particles just sort of moving around, bouncing into each other, you could play this in either direction. And in both cases, you would get some process which is allowed by the basic laws of physics. Yeah, so if we think about the like what's going on according to the basic laws of physics insofar as they're time reversal invariant this tells us that there's no basic irreversible processes so if you can get from some particular state to some other state you can also get back to that first state so when we think about things like smashing glasses and things we might think of these things as irreversible they can't be undone but what we learn from looking at the, the time symmetry of, of the laws of physics is that, well, if we were just to view these in fine enough detail, so in terms of the, the, mo the motion of the particles that make up, say, the, the, the glass and so on, that really that process is reversible. So one thing that suggests to me is that 
talking as though things really do go from past to future is something that becomes really useful in our everyday sort of macroscopic environment situations where we do have this pronounced uh, time asymmetry of entropy where we do have these irreversible processes which you know it would be somewhat bizarre to talk about as though they were happening backwards in time we don't have such an asymmetry in you know fundamental particle physics so in that situation it's not really useful to just talk as though things are going from past to future but it's maybe more useful to talk in a sort of a time direction neutral way to avoid creating sort of unnecessary philosophical problems in that domain so that's what i mean by time as not having a basic direction and it certainly doesn't mean that we're kind of we're doing a bad thing in talking as though time has a direction when we're talking about you know the smashing of glasses it would be you know nigh on impossible to talk about ordinary events in the world without kind of talking as though they're going in a particular direction so matt um i've got a question about entropy i suppose what i'm getting at here is that time always moves forwards we think of mental time travel the ability to remember the past and imagine the future as going backwards and forwards but in truth it doesn't really work like that quite like that does it because when we replay our memories of the past we don't unwind them continuously it's not like the rewinding of a videotape we jump back to a point in time to remember the past. Whereas when we imagine the future, it is a gradual unfolding of events that haven't yet happened and may never happen in quite the way we expect. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think you can you can take it even a little deeper than than that in terms of, you know, the hierarchy of science. Because I mean any biological organism that you know, we could really imagine is one that's going to be subject to the laws of thermodynamics, right? So you're not going to have biological organisms that can remember the future and so on. So we're always going to be restricted into making, uh, you know, to, to, to basing decisions on knowledge of the past and a lack of knowledge of the future. There's always going to be this sense in which we're acting towards the future and we can't really act towards the past. That's going to be out of our control as you know, a biological organism, primarily because of this this uh, time asymmetry coming from the second law of thermodynamics. I, I think I disagree that actually when you go deep to this level of basic concepts when I was talking about, they don't have flow, they don't have direction. They have the me, the, the how do I know it, how certain I am that something uh, is an event. So it's it's like Nikki was saying that what is memory becomes the past, what is anticipation becomes the future, but it's all about the ego. So I just don't see any conflict at all. Cassia, can I ask you a question? The thing I'm wondering about is interesting cultural differences about mental time travel, because I'm thinking about in Western cultures, we always think of the past as behind us, and the future in front of us. But in a number of cultures, and, and certainly um, when I do yoga in, in Hindu cultures, it's often thought that it's better to think of the future as behind you and the past in front of you. In other words, the complete reverse of the way we do it in the Western world. And in many ways, to me, that makes sense because the future is something that you don't know what it looks like. You can't see it yet. So in that sense, the future is behind you. And the past is something you can see because you can remember it. Okay, yes, this is this is a very interesting question. It's not only actually the direction, but it's also culture which prefer time being circular, that, you know, summer is coming again, and that's the default main way of, of thinking. Uh, but again, I would put it on the level of these um, uh, of these uh, molecular concepts, not atomic concepts. Because when you think of that, there are cultures which what well, what it means is that you are facing the past. In some cultures, you are facing the past, and the future is unknown, so it's behind you. You don't know anything about it. In other cultures, you face the future, and the past is behind you. But it's a matter of what you foreground in your culture, what you 
what you make into your standard default uh, concept. Um, but ultimately, uh, it's not it's not that different. Or you have cultures in which you say the uh, the past is in my heart, the future is in my head, things like that. Um, that's, that's really a matter of focusing on something rather than other. Uh, so for example, you, there are languages without grammatical tenses, but languages in which you absolutely have to say where you know about, how you know about something. If you saw it, or if you, uh, if you inferred it from evidence, or if somebody else told you about it, and this is foregrounded, this has to be there in the grammar rather than whether it already happened or will happen. The construction for I read the paper, I will read the paper, I'm reading the paper will be exactly the same. Uh, but lower down on the level of these atomic concepts, you can really see that we are not that different. I wish I had more time to, to say more about it. Matt, did you have a quick, um, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to quickly come yeah, back Yeah, I'd to love those. to. Uh, it'd be a really quick answer. Yeah, if, if we, we jump could. back, uh, just to reply to, to Kasia. Yeah, so I actually, agree with what Kasha says that uh, I don't think there is such a significant conflict between say the, the the psychological model of time the way we ordinarily talk about time and the time of fundamental physics I think where the problem comes in is thinking that there is a conflict so where uh, people maybe overplay the the consequences of say relativity theory uh and time symmetry and things like that into saying that somehow our ordinary views of time are mistaken. I think what it really shows is that, well, you know, there's domains of applicability within how we talk about time. So, for example, the fact that relativity theory says there's no global present moment, that doesn't mean that when I say two things are happening at the same time, I'm you know, making some mistake. It just means that, well, it turns out that that sort of way of talking is just useful locally. It's not it doesn't really make much sense in talking about things which are really far apart in space. And I, I think a similar thing about the direction of time, right? It's very useful to think in terms of things as having a preferred direction. Now, I think there are various explanations for why it's useful for us to do that. And I don't think that sort of talk is, is false or really in conflict with the underlying time symmetry in physics. Where I think there is a problem is thinking that these sorts of models of, of time that are useful in everyday discourse and thinking about, you know, human percep perception of time, that they somehow are all pervasive and should also be applied to when we think about what fundamental physical theories say about time. Because if we try to think that, well, time really does have a preferred direction, even in the situation where there's just, you know, microscopic particles bouncing around in the universe, then I think that that's just, it just creates unnecessary conceptual restrictions in such a case it's better to think in those situations that there isn't some background error of time so i'm much more on the view that there there shouldn't be thought to be this big conflict between these two Im images they're just different ways of talking in different domains so i much prefer a sort of pluralistic approach and as in that sense i think it's wrong to think that our ordinary ways of thinking about time are somehow illusory i don't think that's what physics shows at all I, I just think that there is actually a compatibility there so long as we don't overextend our kind of psychological models of time. Well, that was intense, but at least it ended on a happy note. Yes, it did. But before we wrap up, let's just briefly review what else we discussed, because that conversation knew no limits. Matt started this section by making clear that the physics of time gives a different picture to the one we're used to experiencing and talking about. He mentioned Arthur Eddington, didn't he? Who's that? Aha! Arthur Eddington, the Cambridge astronomer. Played by David Tennant, that's right, the best Doctor Who, in the 2008 BBC drama Einstein and Eddington. A real cork of a name, that one. Gosh, I wonder what it's about. Oh, and I'd completely forgotten who played Einstein. None other than Gollum himself, Andy Serkis. Well, Eddington is most famous for confirming Einstein's general theory of relativity. Not to be confused with Einstein's special theory of relativity, which he keeps for best and only brings out on extra special, precious occasions. Einstein's general theory of relativity predicts that light should bend near to a massive object, such as the sun. It was this which Eddington demonstrated in 1919 through observations of an eclipse. 
Anyway, like we said earlier, Matt's sea theory suggests that time doesn't have a direction because physics doesn't necessarily have a direction. Direction I have necessarily doesn't physics. Meaning eggs can be unbroken and smashed glasses can be, well, unsmashed. Basically, there's nothing to fundamentally stop order arising from chaos, apparently. And this physics-y philosophy view of time is complemented by the psychological and linguistic view. Yeah, Nikki talked about mental time travel. How does that fit in? That's our ability to remember the past and imagine what the future might hold. When we're remembering something, we thankfully don't have to rewind our memories like a VHS. Remember those? Ah yes, I remember good old videotapes. The USB sticks of their day. Well, if our memories were like videotapes, you'd have to rewind through everything that happened between the present and the thing you're trying to remember. Thankfully, we're able to just jump back to that memory, performing mental time travel. But, interestingly, when we think forwards, we often have to imagine the future unfolding in front of us. Skipping ahead is far harder. Matt says that because we're biological organisms, we are necessarily constrained by our perceptions of time. We can never act to influence the past, but we can act to influence the future. And as biological organisms, we're prey to the second law of thermodynamics, which essentially says that disorder, or entropy, always increases. So cups of tea cool down, particles in a gas spread out over time, and the house looks like a bomb hit it after a year of home working. But on a very, very small scale, this law can be broken. Cassia says the idea of basic concepts in language can operate in a similar way to molecules or particles in quantum physics. If so, maybe there isn't really a conflict between how we talk about time and the sea theory of time that MASH is such a fan of, where time has no flow or direction. And Nikki and Kajia threw the following idea into the mix, as an example of how we could think and talk differently about time. Maybe because we know what happened in the past, we could think of it as something we can see, so it's in front of us, and maybe the future, which we don't know, could be behind us as a something we can't see. Not exactly unbreaking an egg, that, is it? No, but it does highlight how we think about time could be tied up with what a particular culture chooses to focus upon and foreground, and this will bleed through into our language. Some languages don't even distinguish between past, present, and future tenses. Well, I was relieved at the end when Matt said we don't need to abandon our perception of time just because physics suggests that it might not actually work the way we think it does. Thank goodness for that. Well, now that that discussion is behind us, or in front of us, I don't know anymore. Well, now that I've heard that, it's made me reevaluate the chicken and the egg, because I guess everything happens simultaneously? Stay tuned for our next episode, where we'll explore what the future looked like in the past. Before then, please fill out our survey. You can find the link in the episode description to tell us what you think of the podcast. Be honest. And make sure to leave us a review on whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. A good one, ideally. And as ever, please spread the mind over chatter word by telling... Just tell everyone. A huge thanks once again to our guests, Nikki Clayton, Matt Farr, and Kashia Yashchout, and to our two fantastic behind-the-scenes helpers this series, the voices of B-Theory and C-Theory, Annie Thwaite and Charlotte Semmel. Music was by the extremely talented Carlo Ladd, and artwork by the equally talented Alex Sadler. See you next time. Bye. Bye.